we're no longer one dimensional. We have these younger players and now that they're playing in games that matter and they know how to bring that intensity that can transition into an Olympic game. When you're getting rid of a starter, a starting outside back who was your captain before Lionel Messi shows up um, and is really good in this league, has the attributes to be a good defender in the MLS. This move is, is more financially sound or a financial movement for Miami. And then I think it's Cincinnati taking advantage of a team that needed to figure out some things financially and they got a really good player. Welcome back into Straight from the Pitch. Joined as always by Sky Schweitzer. I'm Anna Witte. We're coming off a weekend where the U.S. Women's National Team gets the win in the quarterfinals over Colombia. They'll hit the semifinals tonight against Canada. Some changes in MLS. And of course, we have yellow pennies coming back this week. But Scotty, we talk, we got to talk about the big soccer story of the week. It's the U.S. Women's National Team really doing a 180 after their loss to Mexico last week. Sunday night, it was a dominant 3-0 performance over Colombia. Goals from Haran, Nice Swanger, and Jaden Shaw in the first half. What really was the difference between the Mexico game and the Columbia game for the U.S.? Oh, well, I think there's two points to it. I think what the U.S. did is one factor, and then how Colombia played is is the other factor. Mm -hmm. For the U.S., I'm hoping that it was completely Hayes' call with the lineup. I think those are the the players, the younger players, the younger generation. They have a different brand of soccer that they play. Yes, they get forward, they attack, but they can play out of tight spaces and play and, and manipulate through their passing and movement. They can manipulate the defense much better than the old guard that kind of plays straight forward and tries to look to get in behind and, and basically like almost over the top because I wouldn't say it's transition that the old guard play because we usually have the ball a majority of the time too. But it's it's just more of a, a long ball kind of a a game that they 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 play. The younger girls, they play a better generation. I mean, th their generation plays a much better brand of knocking the ball around, moving it, keeping it, and then when there's breakdowns defensively, then they attack the spots that have been broken down. And I think that's what we saw. As far as Colombia, we were talking earlier. I think they like only got half the tape of what Mexico did. So when Mexico played us, you know, they press. And, and it's a known fact. If you want to beat the U.S., you have to you have to press us. You have to get the ball and make us uncomfortable. Um, but what, what Mexico did was they pressed on different spots in different planes of the field based on how tired and fatigued they were as a unit. So sometimes they press super high in our third, in their offensive third, our defensive third. Sometimes they press right at midfield. Sometimes they sat in a low block and then waited for the ball to get in certain areas of the field or certain players on our team that they must have, you know, through their, their videotape and analysis said, okay, this is a person that kind of panics on the ball. And then they pressed that, that specifically. But then once they got their energy back, then they could go back to pressing higher up the field. So they, they did it in stages. They always were looking to press, but they were looking to do it in different ways, whereas Columbia looked to press constantly and they stretched themselves out and draw themselves out of their defensive shape which with the players that we played in this game, it was much easier for us to attack it and then get results and get goals and get scoring chances. It's a little bit more of a physical game than the Mexico game as well. I mean, you saw it from the jump when Alex Morgan got the penalty kick. Like they were all over her on that penalty spot trying to play the mind games as well, which was a phenomenal tactic from Colombia. The U.S. did a good job with their composure. And I think, too, the U.S. came out flying a little bit more. There was a lot more of energy than there was in the Mexico game where I think they started really flat. I think Alex Morgan, this was a game where she proved herself in my eyes, specifically in this tournament. She really led that press. She never stopped. She dropped back defensively. I thought she did a much better job with her holdup play than I've seen her in recent years, even specifically with her NWSL team. Um, she was able to connect and connect those lines out wide, which was one of our big issues last week when we were talking about the Mexico team, there wasn't much interchangeable play in the attacking third of the field. And even the starting lineup change was huge with nice Swanger out there. Gurma coming back on the field for Becky Sauerbrunn brought a new energy, a new lightness, I guess, to the team. And also just these new young players being on the field are going to bring that energy naturally. And we talk a little bit about Alex Morgan being in that starting lineup. Sophia Smith came on the field as a sub. But when you look at what Alex Morgan brought, 
compared to what Sophia Smith brought, who Sophia Smith is is stronger. I think she wants to just go a lot more than Alex Morgan does. Um, Sophia Smith did get beat off the ball a few times against Columbia as well. Which player would you start in the semifinal game against Canada based off specifically that Columbia match? Um, so off of the Columbia match, and I, I'm just going to premise it by saying I watched the Mexico Paraguay game right before the U S played Ca yeah. uh, Columbia Good game. and there was watching the game. You could tell the Mexican team has some really high quality players, but not one player on that team plays for themselves. They play for Mexico. They play for the team. And I think the game that we played against Colombia was one of the first times where we looked like we were playing for the badge. We were playing for the United States. We weren't playing for our social media accounts. We weren't playing for our, our pocketbooks. We were playing to win the game. And I think in that role, Alex Morgan does a better job than Sophia Smith, primarily because I think Alex Morgan doesn't have as much confidence in her one-on-one -on -one dribbling skills as Sophia Smith does. So sometimes I think Sophia Smith thinks I can beat anybody out here, which is a forwards mentality, but she gets into bad spaces and bad spots because she dribbles into bad spaces and bad spots where Alex Morgan will get the ball off of her foot. And when you look at our goals besides the penalty kick, but even the buildup to the penalty kick, they were crosses and passes with assists where sometimes right. it seems like we do a lot of things individually. And, and in that lineup with the players we have brought in, I think Alex Morgan is the best nine. If we're going forward with the same, get it wide to draw them out, to play it back, to play to the top, to play across. If we're looking to play like that, then I feel Alex Morgan is a player that will, she'll hold up play. She will lead the press. She's um, at times when she's in the mood, she's an old school number nine. And the old school number nine was called a leader. And it wasn't basically because they led the team or they were the captain. They led the defensive press. Most people think it's the leader. You're the highest up. You're the last to touch the ball, but you're the leader. You're trying to score. The leader was the reasoning because it was about defensive pressure. And they lead the press and how we're going to shape the field and how we're going to, when we're going to go and why we're going to go. And she does a real good job of that when she's in the mood to defend like that. And when she does it, she ends up getting penalty kick calls. She ends up getting goals. She ends up getting chances. She ends up getting chances for other players. But this was one of the first games in a while that I saw us playing. We were playing for each other. We were playing for the team. We were playing for the country. We were playing for the fans. And I think we've, we lost a little bit of that because we gotten so good and, and had won so many tournaments and won so many trophies that players started to believe, well, I'm the reason. Well, when you bring in this new crop and they're trying to leave a legacy and they're all young and doing it all together, it gives them an opportunity to play. Let's all help each other get there. Let's all yeah. help us win. Let's get us back on, on the, um, the right page. And, and I think that was, that, was, that was the best we've looked in a long time. And listen, I'm a Haran fan, and I was hoping that Moultrie started. I, I, was, you know, I wanted some different little things just to see. Let them, let them go see if they can win this. They all have quality. Are they leaders? Are they going to take us to the next phase of U.S. soccer? Um, I'm glad she got in the game. But but for as far as some of the other changes, like I think Nicewanger is going to be hard to knock out of that spot. We've been totally. saying it for years. Coffee is a different type of player in the midfield that allows everyone to flourish. I think um, uh, Albert is a, is a different type of player. We now have an eight. We have an eight that – okay, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. I will, because I think that's a conversation that we should focus on is that combination between Corbin Albert and Sam Coffey. You mentioned, I mean, we all know they haven't played a lot of minutes together before. And this was really the first game where we've seen them play more than just 20 minutes here or there. And it was a good partnership with Lindsay Horan specifically in the 10. Eventually, Olivia Moultrie came onto field, the field for Lindsay Horan. But what did you see out of that partnership from Sam Coffey and Albert, who played maybe a little bit more of an eight at times, and Sam Coffey was left in the six? So there's, um, and I just actually went to a practice for my daughter's team, and it was one of the things they were stressing. So in soccer, you know, we're supposed to look to the furthest point first. We, to play direct in a sense. Like if I can get a breakaway every time, I get a breakaway every time. The name of the game is to score and beat them. But other teams know that that is the name of the game. So they, they shut off the passing lanes going straight forward. They don't want to give you that. So then your job as a player, yes, we're always supposed to be looking to the furthest point first. 
But our real thing is, how do we get to the furthest point the fastest without losing the ball? And I think that's something that Coffee and Albert do really good. They find the pockets of space to break lines, even if they're small lines. They break lines, get behind the defense, and then move the ball again. And that's that's what I say. Like When you play very similar game mentally as a player, it's an easy transition to click into, even if you're not on the same club team, even if you don't know each other for Sometimes it's just certain players see the game very similar and Coffee mm-hmm. and Albert see the game real similar. They know what they're trying to accomplish, but they know that it's a it's a long game. It's a 90 minute game. It can't we can't score every second we touch it. So like if we're getting shoot three goals in 45 minutes, any team would take that. And, and that's what we did in the first half. We got three goals in 45 minutes, but it was actually because we weren't stressing to go forward. We were patiently trying to get forward and doing it at the right times. And those two are the catalyst of how that all starts. And then with Fox and Nicewanger coming up and picking times correctly, like Mm -hmm. the goal we scored, Nicewanger hits that shot from the top of the 18. That's our Mm -hmm. left back. So that's getting in in a position because she's allowed to based on how our movement and shape was created in the, in the run of play. Exactly. And I also think, too, there's that difference between two midfielders who know that they have to be patient, but can't like be patient. But it's also coffee and Albert know how to keep the ball like they can pass it back and forth. They can wait and for that moment because they know how to stay in control of the midfield before they have to. I think in prior years, maybe even we saw in the World Cup at moments, we felt really rushed to get the ball forward because our midfield didn't have control of the ball at moments, but you can see Coffee and Albert have so much confidence on the ball together in that midfield. And with Nicewanger being a formal former 10, she played the 10 at FSU, now transitioning into that outside back position. She has that freedom to go forward and she knows how to rip, rip those types of shots. Alex Morgan was the one who created that assist. The ball did go off the top of her head. She wasn't selfish in, in trying to create that for herself. I think she's gotten to a point in her career that she knows that she can't just be the goal scorer. She has to facilitate it for younger girls who are stepping up and are able to score those types of goals. So I'm really excited for that combination between Albert and Coffee. I like their personalities off the field. I like how they carry themselves. I think they can be future leaders of this team and really what the spine of this field really looks for. We talk about the forwards. And not only do we have Alex Morgan and Sophia Smith, but Mallory Swanson, has been in the mix. She's coming back from her injury. And then there's Katerina Macario, who has now played after 600 plus days of not being able to play soccer because of her knee injury, goes into the Chelsea game, scores a goal for her up and coming head coach, Emma Hayes, who was really happy with her performance, was really excited about the progression that she has seen from her with the Olympics just a few months away. Sophia Smith and Alex Morgan aren't just fighting for that position themselves. They are also fighting for Mallory Swanson and Katerina Macario to stay off the pitch with those. If the U S women's national team, let's say sticks with that four, three, three position or formation, who do you think would be the best combination of, of three based off of what we've seen right now, if Swanson and Macario could go. If Swanson and Macario could go and you're going to tell me, they are at where they were before injuries. I think those two are are getting on the field. I think Alex Morgan and Sophia Smith are, if that's the scenario, Macario is 100% healthy. And Emma Hayes is the way she coaches and, and plays and sets her teams up. I think she's looking for more of a Macario official. I think she was real high on her prior to the injury also. I think that's the nine she looks for. So I would think Morgan and Sophia Smith are basically fighting Who's coming up? Who's the sub coming in if Macario is, is 100% back to where she was? And that gives us a different dynamic of breaking down lines and having midfielders run through or diagonal runs from. And I think Swanson, she was super effective right before her injury and she mm-hmm. was our best player. But that was also back to that system where and teams were allowing us to play over the top. So now it seems like a lot of teams have figured out. You know, either set a low block or high press in the back so we can't get good balls over with good coverage in behind. Um, But the way she was playing and if she could be at that ability and teams are allowing her to play like that, now now we're looking at, okay, you got Alex Morgan or Sophia Smith came off. That was the nine. Who else has to then come off? Because in that formation, 
it was almost like who was out left, who was that out left player that was sliding out there and, and getting on the ball that is now coming off the field. You, you know what I mean? Like, is that Haran that has to come off? Who Who's the player that now has to be taken off the field? I thought Rodman in this game was doing her job of getting down the line, but not cutting inside to shoot. She was getting crosses off. She was laying balls back. She was dangerous in doing that where we had a true winger who was facilitating play, not trying to score herself. So if Swanson comes back and you have Swanson, Rodman, Macario, then in the midfield, who who do we, you know, it was Haran. Um, Albert and Coffee. Albert, Coffee, and then in the back. But we're missing a player that would just play in this game that, Who's the player that we take off from the last lineup if Swanson goes in? Good question. Uh, I would say Rodman. Like, I think Swanson, personally, I think Swanson has that ability. Well, like I'm saying, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, in, in my eyes, the way the game played out, I got it. I don't know why I'm an idiot. Jaden Shaw. We're, we're missing Jaden Shaw. And I think oh, Jaden yeah. Shaw has to be on the field. So does right. Haran come out? That's if Swanson is allowed to run the line like she was before her injury. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because now you take Haran out and you put Jaden Shaw in Haran spot and you say, you're the 10. You're the 10. But don't worry, Macario can play the 10 too. So you guys can intertwine as that nine. If those center backs will say, okay, who's who's the nine? Who's the 10? Does one of us have to step? Wait, they're both back in there. They're both playing like a false nine. You, you know what I mean? Like when these two players come back, I think, and that's the beauty of this younger generation, man, it opens up a whole bunch of... Do we go to a 4-4-2 and play a, like a rotating diamond that's really not a rotating diamond? It's a coffee sitting at the base of the diamond, and the triangle can rotate and get high and shift because I think Shaw could do that. I think Moultrie could do it. I think Haran could do it. I think Albert could do it. So, like, it gives us different – and now with Nicewanger and Fox, they could cover the line because they can get high enough up the pitch athletically, physically, intelligently, technically – so it gives us a whole bunch of different things that we can throw at people. If we have two up top, does that now help Sophia Smith? Does that now help Alex Morgan in the way we play with them being able to run diagonally wide, diagonally crisscrossing? Like, I think this younger generation gives us the opportunity to play different styles of play against different opponents so we're not easily scouted and watched on video and say, oh, you're going to play the U.S.? High press. Sit here. Playing a low block when you're tired. Do this. Because right. Colombia obviously took a page from Mexico. They just didn't do it as good as Mexico did. They just weren't able to do it as good. And then they got frustrated thinking, hey, the, the U.S. is on a low. They're, they're beatable. We can beat them. So they went in there with this confidence. And then when once the game started, the U.S. was on fire. We were mm -hmm. playing good. We were breaking them down. We were playing through the lines. We were moving the ball. We were manipulating how we wanted to. And that then started to cause the game to get even chippier than it probably was talked about in their meetings. Like, if you have to foul, take them down. But it, it, got, it got real chippy. It was like dirty little tackles, little clips from behind, a lot of chirping. And, yeah. and that kind of happens when you go into a game thinking, hey, we got a chance. And then you realize, oh, we got no chance. Right. Because the second half, we didn't score, but we still were just as good moving the ball around. Like, there was never a threat. A couple shots here and there. I'm sure someone's going to give us a, a time limit when Columbia had, like, four good passes. They ended up giving Alyssa Nair the, the player of the match, which is fair. She had she came up with several big saves. But to your point, and, and to the point that there's so many different forwards, like the Jaden Shaw, Alex Morgan, Trinity Rodman, Mallory Swanson, Katarina Macario, and I'm sure I left a name off of that list, we're no longer one-dimensional. We have players, uh, Lynn Williams, if, if you want to eventually put her in the mix, I'm okay with leaving her off personally. But it just shows that us U.S., we can be more than just one dimensional. Like we have these younger players and now that they're playing in games that matter and they know how to bring that intensity that can transition into an Olympic game and they know how to play together and it could be good. The other sub that we saw that I think is a really important to note and we're, we've kind of been dancing around it is Jen and I swung are coming in for crystal Dunn in this game before 
really before this gold cup, I really liked Crystal Dunn, like being a part of this national team. And I still do. And I saw her having a bigger role, but now that nice swanger has gotten more minutes with the national team under her belt and you see her confidence, like before, I think she was a little bit more comfortable paying it back, playing more safe. Now that she has that confidence with the freedom to go forward, Crystal Dunn could be out of a starting position with Jenna Nyswanger having that versatility down that left flank. I, I agree. This is what I think. And I, and I, we're going to go back to the last show because we got a lot of views and a lot of comments. And I think sometimes people misconstrued thoughts, I, I definitely that I have. Um, but when I was talking about the Mexican players and I was saying that they were created here and then we got pushback that they get become pros in the Mexican league. I took, listen, I get it, but no one when at 18 said, Hmm, I think I'll play soccer now and I'll go to Mexico and become a great soccer player. Right. So like you have to have a base set and I'm saying they got their base here in the U S yes. They probably come from Mexican families who watch league MX and the women's league in Mexico. So you're getting a different brand of soccer. I totally agree. And then you go home and your family knows the game and you discuss the game and you get this mentality of how you want to play and, and how you attack the game. And I get that. But what I'm saying is the U S for a long time took these big, strong athletes because they knew they could win at the younger age groups. As we get older, these players start to come into their prime as far as the players we didn't take the players in other leagues, more money's going into these other leagues, better coaching. I, I discussed it with you earlier. I coach a girl, she's older now, and she played at the club here locally. And she got moved down from the top, very top team, academy team or whatever it was at the time, ECNL, DA. She got moved down to like the third team because she's not as a physical of an athlete, super technical and super good mind. And the coach came to her and said, we're going to move you down one more team because even though you're the most technical and best soccer player and have the best mind, we play kick and run with athletes and you can't play at the pace of the game that we play at. So we're going to move you down. Now, how do you tell a player that they're the best on the team? And instead of moving up to play with better players, we're moving down because up is just more of the same of what you were on this team. That's what I was saying about the Mexican players that play in Mexico. They weren't getting a fair shake here because of the style of play didn't fit the style of coaching that we had at some of the generations, the twenties, the seventeens, blah, 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 men and women on the women's side, we produce much better players than on the men's side. So it's mm -hmm. more easily applied in games and we still get results. Now we have a generation of players who came up with the futsals playing in, in boys leagues, playing in faster leagues and have better decision-making processes. So we have a better team on the field. Now for Crystal Dunn, Crystal Dunn can play like that. Also, she can move into the midfield. She can go and play a midfield role. She doesn't have to play in the back anymore. It's a, you go to the Olympics, even this tournament, you get tired. Does Sam coffee need a rest? Does she need only 45 minutes a game? Does, do now we change it and we say, okay, you're going to attack as the 10 in this role in the top of the diamond. That's where I think, and I don't know Crystal Dunn, but if she's a great leader and a great veteran, this is a veteran we need who's going to put it in day in and day out in training, knowing that her minutes are going to be limited based on what the team needs in order to win. And I think that's where Crystal Dunn could help this team. Being a starter in the back, I think those days are long gone based on what we just saw. Right. To your point, Crystal Dunn being this utility player, we see Emily Sonnet now getting her second win. The U.S. really liking her in that six has been more of that sub for Sam Coffey. I agree with you. I'd rather have Crystal Dunn in there than Emily Sonnet as the six. I trust Crystal Dunn, not only her knowledge, but her speed and her pace, her ability to connect in there way more than what I've seen from Emily Sonnet. Maybe that's something Emma Hayes has noted and is one of the reasons why they're keeping her maybe in a defensive position for her to sub in there. Maybe not. We didn't see Sonnet recently. Yeah, though, like so. Sometimes you bring in a, a six or you sub in a six and the game then because you bring in a Sonnet who's much more defensive in her thought process than she is offensive. So you bring mm -hmm. in her as a six and now we're just defending the last 20 minutes. Whereas if you bring a Dunn in, she still has the ability to go forward and still has the mentality to go forward, but knows that her role is to – to kill the game off 
that's helpful because we can still maintain possession while we're kind of killing time. Or you bring in, now you bring in both of them, and Sonnet is a deeper six, almost bringing in three center backs, which she's played before. And now you have five across the back line, and you're just killing time and giving people a chance to rest legs for the next game. And that's where we become a dangerous team. That's why Spain will win tournaments. That's why England can win tournaments. Their bench is just as good as the players that are starting. And it's really just the coach's decision of what type of game we're going to play. And this is the first time in a long time I think the U.S. has the ability to say, how do we want to play today? How do we want to win this game? And we don't have to do it just one way. Now, my last point is I don't think Kilgore is the person <laughs> that can ever do that. I, I don't think she makes good decisions. I don't think she's – I think she might be doing the subbing at this tournament – but the starting lineup seems to me to be coming from Emma Hayes and certain things she might want to look at. But then the subbing sometimes is just like, I, does it make sense as this tournament's gone? Even we talked about it and like, I would play Rose Lavelle probably too, but like, did I need to play Rose Lavelle in this game based right. on how the game was going? Like, am I getting her in to see if she can take this? Is her injury better? Like, but there was just some of the subs. Sometimes we sub in a player like, that's the same player we just subbed out and, and it's not going to affect the game. It's not going to change the game or we sub in and we stay in the same formation. Like we're usually making subs. It's not always just because legs are tired. We don't just need fresh legs. Sometimes we need to, to, to change the game, to get something going differently, to, to, to look at something else at, at three, nothing where we trying to get another goal at three, nothing at halftime. We could go in and say, okay, girls, we're up three, nothing. We need three more because it's goal differential and then press the game. Or we could say, okay, it's three, nothing. Can we kill the game off without playing defense? Can we play in their yeah. half? Like you can, you can manipulate the game how you want it to work on specific things, especially when you're up three, nothing. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what we saw because I could see an argument be made. Why didn't we score in the second half? Sure. There were a few opportunities. I think Alex Morgan left one off the table. Olivia Moultrie left one off the table. But it was still good connection inside the 18, almost inside the six that we saw, which is something we didn't see in the World Cup, something that we hadn't seen of late. But now that we've gotten these younger girls in the mix at higher state games, we're starting to see it happen more and more. And we'll probably see it happen today. U.S. Women's National Team plays Canada at 10.15 Eastern time. If they win this semifinal game, there'll be a match on Sunday. We'll be watching all of it, so make sure to stay tuned here on Straight From The Pitch. We'll be breaking down all the soccer, but it was a really good win for the U.S. national team. And again, another great look at players uh, before we hit NWSL in a few weeks, and we'll be seeing them a lot more in club play. MLS just well, wrapped up. Go ahead. I, I just can't wait to see this lineup. Yeah. yeah that's what the, Tonight will be real. The, the lineup itself will be the first thing that I think we should all be like, okay, what are we going to look like? What are we looking to do? You know, Canada is probably one of the best teams in the tournament, if not the second best. Maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're not. Mexico, I'll tell you, they impressed again when I watched them. I really like the way they play. Um, I, I haven't seen Brazil, but we all know what Brazil is. But, like, how is Canada going to play against us? What are we going to throw at them? Like, what players are we going to throw? Like, to me, this is a great test for the young players again. I hope we stay with a lot of the young group. Please, I pray. And also Me Canada too. has, you know, Adriana Leone, who played at Portland for a good chunk of this past season. And there's a lot of Portland players on the U.S. women's national team. So it'll be interesting to see her and, and how they try and stop her. I think you said five goals she's had in the W Gold Cup so far. She, yeah, she was she early the the, and she might have had more. I, don't, I didn't follow the last game. I don't know who scored, but right. early, she, I think she was like two, two games, five goals or something. Three games, right. five goals. Something ridiculous. Impressive been hot. Stage play for her. Yeah. Well, MLS has just wrapped up their second or match day two. And there was some big news out of Miami and Cincinnati because U.S. women's sorry, U.S. men's national team outside back DeAndre Yedlin has been traded from Miami to FC Cincinnati for one hundred and seventy two thousand seven hundred and ninety nine in twenty twenty four general allocation money. Um, Yedlin spent two seasons in Miami along with seven season overseas. He was a homegrown in Seattle for a long time, 30 years old. He's got plenty of veteran experience, which will really help this FC Cincinnati team. A good move for him. But we see $173,000 heads to Miami, a team who needs the money. What do you expect Miami to do with it this year? Uh, I'm going to go with that's either money they're going to use for 
what's his name? I always get him and his dad messed up. Frederico Redondo, the Argentine. I'm pretty sure that's just been signed. I don't know if it's been fully cleared paperwork and everything. Um, but Miami is also in financial trouble with the league. They have kind of broken the rules a little bit. So I'm wondering if, because when you're getting rid of a starter, a starting outside back, who was your captain before Lionel Messi shows up um, and is really good in this league, has the attributes to be a good defender in the MLS, the style of play that is brought. Um, he's a veteran. He's played overseas. You know, he can, he can get along with the guys that come over that we bring over the, 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 the DA players. The, the, yeah. So I think this move is, is more financially sound or a financial movement for Miami. And then I think it's Cincinnati taking advantage of a team that needed to figure out some things financially. And they got a really good player to come in and fit their system and the way they play. And, you know, that's Noonan and his staff doing a great job finding a player that fits their system and bring them in to, and the, the way he plays and the way he approaches the game is I'm, I've played in Ohio is, is an Ohio way, you know, like you play for the team, you play for the city, you play for the fans. And that's what Yedlin has done throughout his career. He's always played mm -hmm. the game the right way. You know, I um, wasn't always a huge believer in his ability at certain yeah. levels, but for the MLS and for where he is, he, he's a great player but he plays the game the right way in his mind and in his heart. So I think this is a huge pickup for Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati's obviously player-wise winning out, and I guess Miami did what they needed to do financially to make sure they don't get in too much trouble. Right. And yet Lynch joining his fellow U.S. men's national team, Miles Robinson, on the back line. So there's famili familiarity there. It's great for FC Cincinnati fans. It continues to grow the game there. And, and a club that's been really good the past few years. Uh, for Miami, like who fills that gap for Yedlin in that outside back position? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. We haven't seen, like he's played. I, I don't remember him ever getting subbed out in the games, you know? I mean, so I don't yeah, know right? who's going in there. Do they have a younger player that we haven't seen? Do, do I, I don't know, you know? that They're also, granted, it's super early, but them, you know, they're leading the East with seven points, two wins and a tie. So it's it's an opportunity for them to make a move and sh maybe let the fans know, hey, look, we're really trying to go and win it. We're I, I don't know. We don't know enough about Miami this early in the season to know who fills in back there because that's two defenders they've lost from last year's starting back line because in the right. offseason, they got rid of their center back and now they're getting rid of their right back. So maybe they know something we don't know. Uh, obviously, they do. Um but I, I truly think that it was more about the money than anything else. And they must have a player that they're high enough on that they feel can fill that role. Um, right. But he's on Messi's side and he's going to have to defend. And that was one of the things Yedlin could do. He's always had an engine. He's always had a motor. He's got, he's fast. He can cover ground. So whoever fills that is going to be doing a little bit more than they're doing on the other side because you have Messi usually hanging out on that right side. Good point. Well, we'll find out because CONCACAF Champions Cup happens Thursday. Both Miami and FC Cincinnati will be playing in that. Then Miami will play Montreal on Sunday and Cincinnati will play against DC United. Real quick thing about Miami that I want to bring up from a few games ago. Was it Messi walked out with Kim Kardashian's son, Saint? And I think it caused kind of a stir. Some people felt like it was Nepo baby that he got to walk out with Messi. Some people are like, yeah, whatever, who cares? What For me, I'm like, whatever, who cares? It's Kim Kardashian. She's going to get what she wants. She always gets what, what she wants, and it's cool for her son. It's great for the game that Kim Kardashian is in Miami for that game. What did you think about that? Are people making a bigger story out of it than it really needs to be? Uh, yes. I, I mean, they're, they're, I mean it's gonna, no, it's going to happen. You know what I mean? And Miami's right now, they're playing this huge game of – get as much as we can while we can like really like come on every game you see somebody in the stands like i didn't know will smith like soccer but he's at the games now kardashians right. all about all the soccer she helps you know us uh tell us about the world cup and what venues are gonna be and she announces it out in la so like to me is like i'm sorry for the little kid who was in the lineup that didn't get to go walk out with messi because usually it's like the local teams get invited each game to walk out though somebody didn't get to go but that that's listen that's life i was gonna <laughs> that's, say that's, that's just, how it works that that's life. how it works 
It's not always what you do. It's how you, who you know. And uh, Miami right now is is playing a big, you know, do they want Kardashian maybe to throw some money their way at some time, become a minority owner? There's always people getting into the game and becoming these little minority owners of teams, especially in the, in the soccer realm right now, NWSL, MLS, overseas, LeBron with Liverpool. I mean, so to me, yeah, he's going to walk, he's going to walk out with somebody in LA too. Don't worry about it. It's, it'll be fine. It's yeah, going to happen. It'll it's going to happen again. How many games in the season? Like, it'll be fun. You can wait your turn. You get a win yeah. when you can get wins if you're Miami and David Beckham. Also, good point with Kim Kardashian. Let's say she becomes a Miami uh, minority owner in Miami. My Fort Lauderdale's getting a USL Super League team who might be interested in the Miami area who might want to kind of put some money in that in those pockets. I don't know. Yeah, that's going to be something that I'm going to keep my eye on. Well, we're going to stay on the topic of yellow pennies, pop culture type stories, because there was a handful in soccer these past few weeks, and we haven't had a yellow penny segment in a while. So why not? Mine is Boston Celtics. Drew Holiday wears his wife's U.S. Women's National Team number 12 jersey. Lauren Holiday, an iconic player with the U.S. Women's National Team, and the jersey was misidentified as Miles Robinson's because Boston Celtics put out, what did it say? Holiday repping U.S. men's national team. Uh, A lot of people were not happy with that one. Um, I totally understand why. I mean, I don't know how this this social media team missed it because there's only how many players on an NBA team. You have to know that Holiday was or is married to a former U.S. women's national team player, and why would he wear any other soccer jersey but hers? Huge miss by the social media team. It's not the end of the world. I don't think anybody should get fired over it, but gosh, it makes you kind of go like, do your homework, buddy, before you post anything. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I agree. You got to know that he's married to her. Um, right. Yeah, when you're putting it out, it would be one thing if somebody else put it out, just like, oh, look, he's representing, but it wasn't. It was the Boston Celtics, like, just social open media. up the program. Open up the program. I'm sure it says it in the program. And then, like, yeah, Do I agree. Like I thought it was funny. When I read it, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, you got to be kidding me. And I'm sure there's things I miss all the time. But like, if that was my job, I would definitely not. I would have made a bigger thing about like, why? Why this game? Why? What's the significance? You could wear it to any game, but you chose today. Is there a significance? Is there isn't? Isn't one? But yeah, when, when you put it out there, you're like, that you're, he wasn't representing the men's national team. He was representing his wife, his wife and the women's national team. So maybe it was because the tournament's going on. I don't know. Like yeah. I would have got that information and then made a comment about it. Well, there was like an opportunity there. had the picture. The Celtics had an opportunity to post about the W Gold Cup or just like post about the tournament in a way, like give Holiday that ability or that platform to like, I don't know, like run with it, you know, like, okay, he's wearing the U.S. Women's National Team jersey. How can we incorporate how the U.S. is playing right now or or what their schedule looks like right now kind of into what we're doing? Because then we'll draw in the soccer fans into the NBA. I don't know. I'm not a marketing expert, but I'm enough of an expert to know that you have to get that one right. Yellow penny. <laughs> what about you? Yellow penny. Oh, I'm going to go where I normally go, either U.S. soccer or MLS, and I'm going to go with the MLS. And my okay. MLS yellow penny that has two of them. For one, listen, the refereeing normally in the MLS is not that great. You know, there's mm-hmm. better refereeing around the world. So normally it's not good. And now there's a, a work dispute and a money issue. So now we're getting the second tier referees, and they have been atrocious uh, atrocious i mean like when it's a decent game like well that wasn't too bad but the kansas city call late in the game missing the throw in and then they gives, gives them a corner kick and then they get a tie i watched the one miami game with the referee who had the the ponytail and i was saying to my wife and daughter he's just giving cards out to to get it you know just to get it in his own book like gave busquets a yellow gave messi a yellow Gave Jordy like he was giving yellows out for like no reason at all, just to be like I, I said. I swear he's gonna Done. take out his selfie soon and take a picture. But then this this weekend, listen, I, I understand that weather plays a part in in soccer and in part of sports, and you have to deal with it. But when the weather is so bad, and it really affects the outcome of the game, and doesn't give both teams the the, the fair chance to show their best of what they work day in and day out. And for years and years to, to play and show a good product. But the game in, in Real Salt Lake in the snow, just, I mean, come on, you're bringing in a team from LA and you're going to play in the snow. And I mean, it wasn't just like flurries, it was ridiculous. 
So like for the MLS to not be like, we have to cancel this game. It's not fair. It's not fair to the fans. It's not fair to the players. It's not fair to people watching on TV. It, it's just, but for them to just say, nope, we're going to play it. Like, really, is it that hard to reschedule a game? Is it that difficult to, to you know, re, reissue tickets and stuff? It was just seemed to me like, let's take the easiest way out and make them play in this game. And I, I forget what the score was, four, nothing, three. It was a blowout. But yeah. I was, if I'm coming from LA and like, really, I got to play in this? And, and LA is a, a passing, small, tight knit little group of how they play, and then they attack and they dribble, and it, it's a real free flowing flair to their game. Like, of course, it was going to be a better game for Real Salt Lake. I just to me is like, why would we ever even play that game? It just didn't make any sense. So my yellow penny goes the refereeing, and then playing in that stupid game in the snow. I give it to the MLS again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the first half of the season, too. There's plenty of time later down the road for them to reschedule that one. I agree. Especially L.A. Maybe they're taking advantage of L.A. being in town, and they know that they can get that win. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Those good are some for good yellow things. <laughs> I feel like we haven't had too many good ones of late, and I, I thought this was a good episode to throw them in there. We'll keep our eye out for them this week because we got MLS starting – Sorry, they're not starting. MLS continuing this weekend. We have NWSL starting up the following weekend. Obviously, W Gold Cup will be playing throughout the weekend and plenty of more soccer. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at SFTP Pod. You can watch us every week on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it if you could give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That just helps us get our show out there. And with that, we'll see you next Wednesday. Have a great week.